It is a privilege uh, to be with you. Even as, as Greg is talking and Rich is praying, I'm just I'm overwhelmed with gratitude. I, I, um, it's an honor. It's an honor to serve in this role. But more than anything, I'm, just, I'm one, among, one among a plurality of leaders here, and I'm so grateful uh, for our elders who are here. One of the first things that I learned uh, 13 months ago when I first engaged with Bay Area about this role, I was like, what's the team there? You know, and one of the things that stuck out to me is that they were not looking for a solo savior. They were looking for a leader of leaders. And so we are a church that is led by a plurality of leaders. We follow in the beautiful example of our Bay Area elders who come together. And I've just, I have learned so much from Greg's leadership and from the elders, how to agree and disagree and how to commit and decide. It has been a beautiful heritage that we have as a church. And that's what it is. We have a heritage. Uh, you know, a lot of times we, we focus on the new because it's, it's the first day. Entrepreneurial spirit. It's exciting. We're a startup. First day. But this is not just any old startup. We are coming from a long line. We have a heritage, and it starts with our Bay Area family who we're extremely grateful for. Uh, Chad made the example of, like, we're moving out of our mother's basement, you know, and so we're going from daughter church to sister church, all right? We are on the same team, on the same mission. We have a wonderful heritage, but more than just Bay Area, we are a part of what God has been doing on earth for the last couple of millennia. We are not the church. We are a part of his church, and that is exciting. And so I'm glad that you're here this morning, uh, not just because of the excitement of this moment, not just because of East Point, but because, friends, God is doing something in the world, and he's doing it through this, this people called the church, and we get to be a part of it. And we get to be a small part of that story, and we love doing it together where we learn the gospel, we live out the gospel, and then we're leading others to the gospel. And we get to do this for as long as until he comes back, which is exciting. And so again, really grateful to be here this morning, East Point. Um, and here's what I'd like to do. Here's what I'd like to do. We have just spent the last seven years moving toward this moment, right? And so for many people here, especially if you're in the core, this moment represents a finish line. We made it. We're here, finally. And you earned your moment. You, you, yes, Sigh of relief. Thank God for what he has done. But here's what we're about to do. Hands up. Back on the starting line. Because we're just getting started. Yes, it's a finish line, but in many more ways, this is a starting line. And so here's what we're going to do. As our first act as East Point Church, for our first series, our first sermon series, we are going to, at the starting line, we're going to look up and we're going to say, God, what now? What are we supposed to be doing? What, what is it exactly that you want us to be like? God, excuse me, why did you plant a church on the eastern shore? And we're going to look to his word, and we're going to say, all right, Lord, show us. And here's the coolest thing that we're going to see in this series, is that God is giving us answers in the form of pictures. Pictures. How many of you know that a picture is worth— a picture is worth a thousand words, and there are pictures in the scripture that are well worth 1,000 words. And we're going to look to these pictures because we're saying, God, what do you want us to be like? What do you want us to do? What atmosphere should be here when we gather as the church? And each week for the next several weeks, we're going to look at these pictures one by one. And this is so critical for us because every single person in this room, you have a picture. 
You have a a preconceived idea of what a church should be like and what should a church do and what should we surround ourselves and how should we spend our time and our resources. And here's what I'd like us to do, church, for the first series. I want us to just lay aside those pictures and I want us to come to the scriptures and say, God, give us a fresh picture. What exactly are we supposed to be like? And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to pray, Lord, would you make it so? Would you make East Point Church live up to and and, and fall in line with your design for the church, capital C? And guess what? After we do that series, we'll continue to do it every week for the rest of our lives until Jesus comes back. Because this is where he speaks to us, friends. This is where he shapes us. When this is open, he speaks to us and changes us. And so, yes, I'm excited for day one. I'm excited for the the screaming baby that is East Point Church that that has just been birthed. You guys look good for being born for like 10 seconds. My kids did not look nearly as good as y'all do right now, all right? And so I'm grateful for this moment, but my prayer is, Lord, change us. Like starting right now, make us, transform us. And the only way I know that that happens is God does it by his Holy Spirit through his written word. And so are you ready to dive in with me this morning? Are you ready for our first sermon, our first sermon series at East Point Church? Hey, I like that. I'm a talker. So this is a a dialogue. We got to talk and communicate, and we're going to have a lot of fun here. So open up your Bibles. We're in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. If you have those blue and white ones that we provide, you can open up to page 979. And we'll be right in that first line. And so we're going to dive into our pictures here in this series. And for our first picture— You guys can probably already guess it because I know you've been paying attention. Our first picture of our series is none other than the bride. East Point Church is called to be like a bride. So let's check it out. We're diving in starting in verse 25 of Ephesians 5. Here's God's word. He begins, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. This is God's word for us this morning. And so here's what we like to do here at East Point. We have a passage of scripture, and then we just walk right down it. So we have three verses here, and we're going to see three points about what God is calling us to be. So let's look at the first verse again, and we'll look at it together. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so we're in the middle of chapter 5 here, and Paul, he is giving husbands in the church instructions. He says, husbands, love your wives. Now, that's a very good instruction. Husbands, we should do that. However, this morning is not a sermon on marriage. This is not a series on husbands and wives. And so the key thing for us from this passage is that Paul is providing a metaphor. He looks to the men and he goes, Men, love and treat your bride as Christ loves and treats his bride. Jesus has a bride. There's Christ has a bride. And and who is his bride? Well, he says it. It's the church. And so right off the bat, we look at our first picture, and we learn something very important about how God views the church. The church is not a building. The church is not an, an institution. It's not a club that you belong to. God, when he views the church, he sees it primarily as a person, or rather more accurately, a people. The church is a living, breathing community of people who have been saved by God and are in a relationship with his son. More powerful. It's not just any old people. Oh, it's not just any old people. It's Jesus' bride. The church is Jesus' bride. I have a friend out in the Northwest, and uh, he's been married for over 25 years. And to this day, every time he talks about his spouse, he calls her my bride. My bride. Hey, I was talking to my bride last night. I'm like, why do you keep calling her your bride, right? Like, I say my wife. I say what normal people do. And no, every, every conversation, my bride. Oh, my bride this, my bride that, my bride and I. And I actually love it. It's because when I talk, when I call my wife my wife, that's her position to me, right? 
When my friend calls his wife his bride, he's reminding himself, yes, that's her position, but more than her position, she is my prize. She was the gift that was walked down the aisle and given to me, and and the gift that I'm cherishing, and I'm going to nurture, and I love. She is my bride. And just like my friend's bride, you church, you're a bride. East Point Church, we are a bride that is loved by Jesus Christ. You belong to Jesus Christ. He is the groom, and we are the bride. And so look at that metaphor, friends. Understand that this church doesn't belong to the lead pastor. This church does not even belong to the elders. This church does not belong to the stakeholders who give the most money. This church belongs to Jesus. You're his wife. You're his bride. He looks out for her. He prioritizes your well-being just like a bride deserves to be cared for. You are his. And do you know why you're his? Because he made you his own. He went to great lengths to make you his. What did he do? Look what he says. He gave himself up for her. The bride was not a gift that was just hand-delivered to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, here's an idea for you. No, he went out, and Jesus procured us. He set his eyes and his affection on this people from before the ages began, and he said, I'm going to make you mine. Jesus procured us. If we had more time this morning, and I'm sure we'll get here over the years, I would share with you my love story. I would tell you of all the ways that I wooed my wife, and I convinced her, and I won her hand in marriage, and I convinced her to be my bride. And then you would talk to her and get her version of the story. All right? And we'll let you decide, okay? I don't have time to tell you all the details, but I will tell you this. The lengths that I went to to make her my bride pale horribly in comparison to what Jesus went through to make you his bride. He didn't convince someone. He didn't spend money. He spent his life. Jesus gave himself up, willingly embracing a cross because he loved us and wanted us to be his. Man, when we, around here, when we say Jesus loves you, when we sing songs about Jesus' love, we're not using the word love the way that your favorite country singer uses it, you know? It's kind of dangerous, this love thing, right? It's something you fall into. It's something you fall out of. It's a feeling that's kind of right here in your tummy, you know? It's love. No, no, no. In the Bible, when Jesus talks about his love, it's not a feeling that he feels one moment and then doesn't the next. His love is action. His love is decisive, selfless, sacrificial, unconditional unconditional love on our behalf. Yes, Jesus loves you, bride, so much so that the cross is our symbol of victory. Because that is the great length to which he went. That is the cost to purchase a people for himself. To buy us back. To redeem those of us who were lost in sin. Who were not worthy to be loved. And he loved us anyway. You see, when we sing about the cross, when we look at the cross, we are remembering that in the cross, we are hearing Jesus say, I love you and I have made you mine. He loves you, bride. He has gone to great lengths to procure you. And so that's us. Jesus is the leader. He is the self-sacrificial leader of the church. And he has made us his. But his plan doesn't stop there. Look in the next verse. Look how he continues to unfold his plan for you, to unfold his plan for the bride. Check this out. Next verse, 26. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And so here's where it gets beautiful. Jesus, he looks to the church, he looks to the people, and he says, you're mine. But then he doesn't walk away and say, so if you need me, call me. (laughs) You're mine. Here's my number. I'm just right up there. I'm just one prayer away. No, no. He says, you're mine. And then he stays right there, and he continues to remain active in the bride's life. And how is he active? It says here that he might sanctify her, that he might sanctify us. You see, church, not only has Jesus procured us and set us apart and made us his, but he continues to prepare us. Jesus 
is preparing us. I've already said you're the bride, all right? You're the bride. The save the dates have been sent. The date is on the calendar. You're already starting to shop. All that needs to be answered is chicken or beef, okay? You can answer that at the picnic after the gathering. So here's the deal. The date is set. The wedding is on. But the bride is far from ready to be presented on her wedding day. Let me say it like this. The bride looks like she just ran a Tough mutter obstacle course in the height of summer. And she hasn't even picked out a dress. Friends, that's you. That's me. We are the bride, but the bride is far from being ready yet. And so if we're going to be walked down the aisle in a way that is appropriate to see the groom, then Jesus needs to continue to prepare us. And here's what's beautiful about the metaphor, right? When he declared us his own, when he set us aside, he didn't leave it up to us. He didn't say, okay, you're mine. Now I want you to go and read some self-improvement books. I want you to get yourself ready. I want you to do your best. Call me when you're ready, and then we'll have the wedding. I have other things to do. No, no, no. He saves us, and then he takes it upon himself to prepare us. Jesus is present with the bride. Jesus is in the midst of his people, actively sanctifying his bride, progressively cleansing us, steadily moving us closer and closer and closer to the picture-perfect bride that he wants us to be when we see him face to face. He's preparing you, church. He's going to prepare us for that day. And here's the best part. He's already begun. He has already begun this sanctifying process. Look what it says. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. He began preparing you the moment he first spoke to you. The moment that he came to you and he started to bathe his people, not with the water of lavender oil or rose water, whatever else you do, ladies, for your wedding day, you know? He, he was bathing us, follow the metaphor, with the water of the word. That message of salvation, the gospel, is the thing that comes to us and cleanses us and sets us apart to himself. And that's why we're going to get baptized uh, after the gathering here. That's why we're baptizing people, because our baptism is a picture of what Jesus has done to us. He is cleansing us. He is washing us off, and he is making us new. Jesus, the groom, is preparing his bride. He's preparing us, church. As I was working on this message this week, this truth, it just, it was hitting me, and it, it was very special to me, because sometimes, I'm going to be transparent here, as a father of three little boys, right, with a lot of responsibilities at home, and man, as a really, really important person, you may find this hard to believe. I, that was a joke, by the way. I, I just, I'm not where I should be. I'm not perfect. I'm still in progress, and this, 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 this passage encouraged me because sometimes I get discouraged by how much more there is to be done in my own life. Sometimes I get frustrated with myself because this progress, this process of sanctification, it feels so slow. And I'm two steps forward and I'm one step back. And I'm two steps forward and I'm one step back. Have you ever been there? And you're going, how am I still here? Well, hey, first of all, be encouraged. He's preparing you. Jesus is working on you. He is not leaving you the way that you are. As a matter of fact, he is actively at work in your life, and he is coordinating. He is orchestrating all of your situations, every sickness, all of your suffering, your key relationships, everything that is going on in your life. He is coordinating that, and he is leveraging that as sanctifying tools that will be used to progress you and prepare you. Nothing is wasted in the kingdom. Nothing is wasted in your life. It's Jesus, the sovereign king who is in your life to prepare you. Be encouraged. And then the second application for you is this. Grace. Give yourself grace. Let's give each other grace. That's the only way this church thing is going to work. If we give each other grace as we acknowledge, hey, you know what? She's not perfect yet. He's still in process. Jesus is still preparing us. Like a bride, we are still getting ready. 
And so, East Point, there is still this ongoing work. The bride is with the groom. We are together being transformed. And so, number one, he procured us. Number two, he's preparing us, and every bride in the room knows what that final step is, right? Why are we being prepared? Toward what are we moving? Last verse here. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Final point of the morning, friends, is that Jesus will present us. Jesus will present us. That's why we're here. That's why this church is meeting in this room on this date and time. This is the end goal toward which everything is moving. The end goal that he had in mind from the very first moment that he declared, you are mine. God's plan is to present the church. To present the church. That day is coming, friends, and we are going to be like a bride. And every bride is walked down the aisle. And we are going to be walked down the aisle after a lifetime of preparation and sanctification. Man, I got married. We just celebrated nine years last week. My wedding day, tricks of the trade here, if you're engaged, do not do a late afternoon or evening wedding. It is the longest day of your life. And so I got ready in 20 minutes. Your boy was brushed teeth, tie on, ready to go. And then I sat there for hours just playing cards with my friends going, is it time to get married yet? And I remember on my honeymoon going, man, wasn't that the longest day ever, Jordan? And she was like, I hardly had enough time. I was like, what are you doing? She's like, from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock, I did my nails. From 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, I did my toenails. From 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock, I did my hair. And then after that, and it was just like, man, it took her forever to get ready for that day. And it's going to take us even longer, church. It's going to take us a lifetime of preparation and sanctification and of being cleansed to be presented to the groom. To the one who gave himself for you. To the one who gave everything to make you his. And on that day we will be presented and forever we will be with the Lord. And so the day is coming that we'll be presented, but here's what's really cool about this passage. And you might not even see it if you read it fast. So if you look very carefully, I want you to see what Paul does here. He takes this metaphor and he adds a wrinkle to it, okay? Look what he says. So that he might present the church to who? To himself. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Check this out here, okay? Not only is he the groom in the metaphor, he's also the one who walks her down the aisle. See, in my wedding, I'll show you a little picture here. In my wedding, there were two very different people here, okay? There was that handsome man in the back, also known as the groom, in some cases known as the prize, okay? More commonly, the recipient. And then there was this bald man in the front. Do you see this guy? What is he doing in my picture? Oh yeah, that's my father-in-law. And you see, me and my father-in-law, we had two very different roles on that day. I was the recipient. He was the preparer. From the moment that my wife was born, he understood that his job was to prepare this little girl, to nurture her, to cherish her, to get her ready, because one day he would give her away, and he wanted her to be ready on that day. And so when he walked down the aisle with his little girl, he was basically saying, I have prepared her. I have nurtured her. I have taken it upon myself to prepare her so that she is ready for you. And now you get to reap all the benefits. That's what he would have added, right? It's not in the text. But here's the cool thing. In my wedding, those were two different people. In the text, it's the same person. Jesus is both the presenter and the prize. He is both the preparer and the groom. He has taken it upon himself to make sure that we are ready for himself. For for himself. And so here's where we go, friends. East Point Church, from day one, we want to understand this. We want to live with this understanding. We want to operate. We want to conduct ourselves. We want to go to community groups. We want to go to the picnic. We want to come to the gatherings with this idea very firmly etched in our mind that Jesus is actively working in our midst in light of that day, that he might present the church to himself. God is going to do things, exciting things, 
difficult things, hard to understand things, beautiful things. He's going to be doing a lot of things in our congregation, and all of it will be done with this day in mind. Understand it, friends, that Jesus, there's not a day goes by that Jesus is not actively aware of us and cleansing us and preparing us and sanctifying us and working on his church so that we would stand before him on that day without spot, without wrinkle or any such thing, holy and without blemish. My wife showed up that day without blemish. Every eyelash was in place. Every hair was in place. Every nail was perfectly manicured, pedicured. You know what I'm saying? She was... She was on point. She was ready. That day did not catch her by surprise. And that's what Jesus is doing to us. Be encouraged, friends. East Point Church, be ready. Because he is making us and he's coming back again. And so I look forward to that day. I look forward to the day when, God, when Christ's bride steps into the aisle and every angel in heaven starts to weep with joy. Not because you're awesome and cool and you look really good. They're going to be weeping with joy because they knew what we were like. And they're going to look to God and say, you made that out of that? (laughs) You made her look like that? All glory to God. All glory to God on that day. The beauty of the church will highlight the glory of God. And so we are a bride and our wedding day is coming. And yes, today is exciting, but this is nothing compared to that day. And so here's what I would like us to do. I want you to think back with me. When I was engaged, I'm going to share a story with you. When I was engaged, uh, we got engaged in March. We weren't married until September. Now some of you go, wow, that's a short engagement. Tell that to a 21-year-old, right? That was forever. Oh my goodness. And then what made it worse is that I moved across the country. So I'm living in Washington State. My wife is living in Washington, D.C. And we're engaged. How many of you know that there was not a day that went by that I was not constantly and and actively aware of the fact that I was engaged, right? If you were to meet me, like one of the first things you hear, hey, my name is Sam, I live here, I'm engaged, (laughs) right? I'm like people at the checkout stand, like beep, beep, that'll be 2587. Hey, speaking of 2587, I'm getting getting married on (laughs) 9-1. And they're like, you're weird. I'm like, I'm engaged. (laughs) The way that I ate, the way that I exercised, the fact that I exercised, the way that I made purchases, the way I handled my budget, my career decisions, where I was going to live, everything in my life was informed by the fact that the wedding is coming. The wedding is coming. And so church, what I'm calling us to here this morning is to be a church, to be a bride that lives and conduct ourselves just like a bride that is counting down the days and in, in light of the coming is actively getting ready. Friend, are you growing closer to being ready? Do you wake up every day of your life and dive into the Word and pray and spend time with your Heavenly Father and go into groups and into your discipleship relationships? Does every aspect of your life drip with the expectation it is coming and Jesus wants to make me ready? I think it's Peter Cesaro who said, you can be a Christian that's 10 years old or you can be a one-year-old Christian 10 years in a row. And this text is challenging us today to be a church that is not simply marking time, that is not content with just holding religious services once a week and occasionally doing a nice gesture to the community. We're not meant to just sit here and wait. We are meant to grow. We are meant to actively live in light of his return. And so we're going to bake that right into our church, right into the foundations as we, I shouldn't even mess with construction metaphors because I don't know the things you pour, but the foundation, I know that. And so right into the foundation, we are baking in this expectation. And so I want to show you, East Point Church, our mission statement, all right? Here's why we exist. We exist to glorify God as a gospel community that is growing in faith and reaching the world. And so you're going to hear that a bajillion times over the next bajillion years, okay? And here's what I want to highlight this morning. Those three little words in the middle, growing in faith. This is our DNA. We exist as a church so that every single person in our church would be growing and living with this sense of momentum, a sense of progress toward that wonderful day. 
We're going to do things in our church. We're going to organize ourselves, and we're going to conduct ourselves in a way that reminds us, and it keeps the wedding day at the forefront of our minds so that we're ready. We're going to be that kind of church, friends. By the grace of God, we will be that kind of church where we regularly ask Jesus to change us, to transform us individually and as a family. Jesus, would you grow us in holiness? Would you grow us in sanctification? Grow us in our faith so that we can stand before the groom one day, holy, blameless, and above reproach, without spot or any such thing, to the glory of God. Church, we're a bride. We are a bride, and the wedding day is coming. And so we have a couple of fun things for you in response uh, to this message and, and the fact that we celebrate. Um, you know, when I, was, when I was engaged, I used to get into these arguments with my wife because she got to wear her ring for the whole engagement. Guys, isn't that unfair? You know, she got two rings. And so I was like, oh man, I'm in Washington and you're so far away. It would just be really nice if, if you'd give me the ring and I can just wear it as an engagement ring and then it'll also be my wedding band. You know, we'll do something new. And she was like, <laughs> no. Not a chance. You will earn that when you meet me at the altar, you know? And I was like, man! But she had a ring. And so here's what we're going to do. As a, as a little token, um, as a reminder, as a visual aid, we are giving all of you rings. I'm not joking. Here's what we've done. On your way out, we have a little gift for you. Um, and it's actually a pop socket that goes on the back of your phone. Looks like this. And look at this. It's a ring. And it has a little East Point emblazoned on that, right? And check this out. Every time you pick up your phone, because I was thinking, either something on their fridge or something on their phones. And I was like, which one do we do more? And for me, it was close. Phones by a, by a millimeter, okay? Every time you pick up your phone, check this out. There's the ring. And it's a reminder. Oh, yeah, we're engaged. Oh, yeah, the wedding is coming. Oh, yeah, I better live in light of that day. Oh, yeah, Jesus is working on me to be ready. And so East Point Church, just a little gift for you as we celebrate uh, a beautiful, momentous start uh, to our life here as East Point Church on the shore. And then the second thing we're going to do here for fun, uh, we're going to celebrate at the picnic uh, baptisms. And so we're talking about that day, right? The wedding day. But we have several people in our congregation who they're taking their first step. And they're going public with their faith. And so yes, that's an exciting day to come. But this is also an exciting day as people have said, man, geez, I get it. I understand the gospel. Jesus has saved me. I want to live for him, and I'm going public with my faith. And so at the picnic, uh, after the gathering here, you can grab the address on your way out. We're going to be celebrating uh, with these several people. So check out this video.